Hello everybody. My apologies for going a while between posting videos. I've been pretty busy at work. Um, I have seen that there have been quite a few new subscribers, so thank you to all of you for spreading the word and for subscribing. I will continue to make videos and hopefully a little more frequently. So the topic of this video is going to be about the zone axis when you are working with a single crystal sample. When I did the videos on high resolution TEM and atomic resolution STEM, I alluded to the importance of zone axis alignment several times. So I wanted to make a video specifically covering it and its application and how to align to a zone axis when you're performing TEM. So the first question we need to answer is what exactly is a zone axis? So in a single crystal, of course, without going into too much detail, we have what are known as crystallographic planes. And those are notated using what are known as Miller indices. So in the case of our schematic here, we actually have four unique planes. Two of them are blue and two of them are red. And we see here that for the two blue planes, we have one denoted with the Miller indices HKL and the other with PQR. So a zone axis is simply a crystallographic direction that is contained by at least two unique crystallographic planes. So what we see here in this schematic is that we have these four unique planes and the black arrow that's pointing upwards is a crystallographic direction, which again has Miller indices, which we use square brackets to denote it because it is a direction and not a plane. But this direction is contained in all four of these planes. And of course, this schematic only shows four unique planes and the common zone axis between them. But in reality, a single zone axis can contain an infinite number of unique crystallographic planes. So how this pertains to TEM is that when we look at a diffraction pattern from a single crystal sample like we have with this simulation here, we see the direct spot in the middle, which is that largest spot or brightest spot as you would see in an actual diffraction pattern. And we see these other spots that are Bragg spots that correspond to Bragg diffraction from specific sets of crystallographic planes. So what I can do then is using my direct spot as an origin, I can draw a vector that starts at the direct spot and points to any of these Bragg spots. And so we call these G vectors in the diffraction pattern. And each of these G vectors is actually normal to the specific set of crystallographic planes that corresponds to each spot in the diffraction pattern. So how this becomes relevant when you are performing TEM, and this is just one example, there are several examples of where finding the zone axis becomes relevant, but perhaps the most important one is when you were doing some type of high resolution imaging of a large single crystal. You want to be very precisely aligned with the zone axis because that's going to give you the best high resolution image. And we can tell how well aligned with the zone axis we are by looking at the diffraction pattern. So if I am well aligned with the zone axis, what I'm going to see is that if I take two Bragg spots, meaning a Bragg spot and its opposite. So in the schematic I have here, you can see I have two spots circled. I have a Bragg spot and its opposite. You could take the right one to be the spot and the left to be its opposite or vice versa, it doesn't matter. But what I see is that the intensity of those spots is the same. And if I'm aligned with the zone axis, that will hold true for any pair of Bragg spots in the diffraction pattern. So I can look at another pair of Bragg spots like you see here, and I see that yes, just like the first pair I considered, those are the same intensity. And I could do this with any other pair and I will find that they are the same intensity. Again, just according to what I see with my eye, but also in a quantitative sense. And again, this is a simulation 
We will see some actual real examples here in a minute. But that is how I know that I am aligned with the zone axis. So the question then becomes, what does the diffraction pattern look like if I'm not aligned with the zone axis? And so instead of seeing this symmetry in the intensities of opposing spots, I no longer see that across the whole diffraction pattern. And so depending on how far off of the zone axis I am, I may actually even see a ring or a circle, which we call a Lowy circle, form in the diffraction pattern, which again is an extreme example of what happens when you're not aligned with the zone axis. So here is a really good example of this that I found in a textbook that shows the progression of being really far off of the zone axis to closing in on it. So if we start in the upper left, we see the direct spot and we can start to see what looks like a zone axis pattern forming, but I'm clearly not satisfying the criterion that every spot and its opposite is equal intensity. And if you look, as I curve away to the right of the direct spot, you can kind of see those spots kind of fall off in a circle. Now, if I get a little bit closer to the zone axis, like in the upper right, you can see now I'm getting closer to satisfying that intensity criterion, but I still have an open circle, which again is what we call a Lowy circle. And so if I tilt and get a little bit closer still, we can see that that circle starts to go away like we see in the lower left. And then if I get closer still, we start to see on the lower right that we're actually starting to get close to satisfying that criterion of every spot and its opposite having the same intensity. Although if you look closely in that image on the lower right, you will see that we're still not quite there because I can still see some instances where a spot and its opposite don't have the same intensity. So the lower right, we are still actually noticeably off from the zone axis, although not nearly as badly as we were when we started in the upper left. So why does having good alignment ultimately matter? Well, if we look at how this impacts the high resolution image, for example, we see a profound effect in terms of the detail in the image that we observe when we are well aligned versus not well aligned. So in this instance, I have a silicon sample and I'm aligned to a 110 zone axis, and I can see a lot of detail in the high resolution image because I am well aligned with the zone axis. So if we look at the same specimen, but with the zone axis not well aligned, and in this case, I'm off by about 17 milliradians, which is about one degree, we see a marked decrease in the level of detail that can be observed in the image. And so one degree doesn't sound like a lot, but that's actually a huge angle in terms of TEM. So a one degree off from zone axis will manifest very obviously in the diffraction pattern and also in the resulting high resolution image. So how is zone axis alignment performed? Well, for starters, you have to be in diffraction mode. So that's the first thing, hit that diffraction button on your right hand panel. And we can see in this diffraction pattern that I have a very evident open Lowy circle. So now I wanna use my alpha beta tilt controls on my left hand panel to close the Lowy circle. And to get to that criterion where every Bragg spot and its opposite has the same intensity as viewed in the diffraction pattern. And we're getting closer here and right about there. It's pretty much perfect. Make a little bit more of an adjustment here. And right about there, right about there. I've got basically perfect zone axis alignment. Now, after you 
align the zone axis, what's going to likely be the case is that you're not going to be at eucentric height, so you need to return to image mode and reestablish eucentric height. And then to complicate matters further, when you perform a Z adjustment to reestablish eccentric height, especially if it's a rather large Z adjustment, more likely than not, the tilt of the sample is going to be slightly different. So then you're going to have to go back into diffraction mode and again adjust the sample tilt to re realign to the zone axis. And so this is somewhat iterative. And then again, you'll have to go back and reestablish eccentric height. And the adjustment should be smaller each time. But this is usually somewhat of an iterative process rather than just do it once and then go back and set the height and then everything will be good, especially if you're trying to make sure your zone axis alignment is as precise as possible. So that concludes the video about zone axes and why they're important and how to align to them when you're performing TEM. Please like, subscribe, and share, especially if you know anybody who would find this video useful. Please feel free to share it. If you have any suggestions for future topics for videos, please let me know. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know in the comments section below. I'm going to do my best to try and upload videos more regularly, especially since I've gotten quite a few more subscribers since I did my last video. Thanks again for your attention.